Hey there, welcome to Negative Balance. Today I'm with Andre, Christian, Tamara, and I'm today's host, Jamar. We're in the Business and Society Student Association office here in VC. Today we're going to be talking about healthy greens. And what I mean by healthy greens is now that society is starting to eat more healthy, certain companies in the marketplace are starting to capitalize off of that. We're going to be looking at some specific examples. We have a McDonald's. McDonald's is going to be trying to reposition themselves, which they have been doing actually, making some somewhat of a considerable effort. I think there's the McCafe spinoff that they've been doing. But recently in the news, they put out that they're trying to become a green company. And they have some uh, goals so that they can um, get there by 2025. But there's also other companies who aren't really making that transition to a healthier palate for, of course, the benefit of the consumer. Definitely in America, there's a trouble with obesity. So I do want to point out an example of that as well. I want to get everyone's uh, personal thoughts so far. What they do see, if you do see any companies that are trying to kind of go green or implement, whether it's even salads, are there any small steps that you're starting to see? Um, I do see that there is a rise in a lot of green production for consumers with fast food industries. A good example, in my opinion, would be maybe Subway Can uh, Canada or Subway in general. I do know that they launched a campaign a couple months ago, up to probably a year ago, um, where they announced all their like greens and vegetables would be you no know, artificial um, preservatives like or additives things like that. A part of their uh, like as a part of their campaign to better eating and a healthier lifestyle. Um, I know the, that consumers weren't as much receptive to it, but it was a step in the right di direction in terms of uh, consumer production and like taking a step towards uh, f sourcing to local farmers and helping in that way. So I do think it was a good initiative, and I think it's something that they can um, uh, continue uh, to uh, initiate into their policies and uh, what they offer their consumers. Especially because, actually, um, I know a couple of years ago, they um, a big uh, executive for them or a campaign person was uh, Jared, the guy who lost a whole bunch of weight off of Subway. So right. um, for them to also add like that their food is... Um, like lack of artificial colors, flavors, that kind of thing, yeah. is a, a, another step in the right direction. Sure. Yeah, and then uh, consumers are just being more aware of the health benefits of eating green compared to eating fast food. There's a lot of cases of, of obesity throughout the United States that much more Americans are being much more aware. So I think that's, a lot of companies are taking advantage of that. This is obviously because there's there's more demand and uh, there's more awareness about eating healthy. Like it's it's an actual like full-on movement right so and then uh, which is great for the consumers and the businesses yeah. So, yeah there's a lot of health benefits as well to eating green um the rise of fast food production throughout the 2000s it's been massive now when companies do pivot from like their original positions if they're using artificial flavors before and um i think that what's common a lot is where it just says natural flavor but i don't know what that really infers because it could be anything um if they were using certain products before in the past and now they're trying to go to um, a place where they're not going to be using this type of like harmful ingredients, I assume they're going to be stopping something because it's harmful or it's just not in the best interest of everyone that is actually eating the products. Do you have any kind of distrust or any reservations to still eating from them because you know now if they're making a change, it kind of exposes them for not doing something that was quite on the up and up just a couple of years back. I think this is a, a relatively new trend or the momentum is definitely increasing now within the last couple of years. Does that kind of taint at all some of their some of their efforts because they're previously known for using those artificial ingredients? Um, I think the uh, it's not when they were doing that back then. I think it was more for like uh, they were pushing the cheaper side like uh, it was affordable food more than the uh, the more than the ingredients in the food right so right now like because uh, uh, there was a uh, the the whole thing that started it was when people started wondering uh, like what what what's in their food like i remember there was like an ad like another ad of, like a video about coca-cola and how how you can use it to clean certain parts of your bathroom which right. is very corrosive right and so like people that's when people started wondering what's really in their food yeah, so you do make a very good point. Um, I think specifically it's the preservatives that companies were using to make their food last longer. I see those uh, those memes on Instagram where you have a burger after maybe like four days, it stays the exact same. But if you have an actual um, real produce, 
in comparison, like a banana, mm. that's gonna spoil after maybe like two days if it's yeah. exposed, if the if the skin comes off, right? Yeah. Then the ear gets to it, it shows that it's a real life ingredient and that's more healthy because the makeup of it, of course, is organic. Yeah. Okay. So I did point out before that uh, McDonald's is making an effort to go green. I also do want to um, point out that there are other companies who aren't uh, perhaps hip to the, um, the overall trend to get consumers to eat healthier, make natural, not natural choices, um, healthier choices, which probably were, were natural because it's the marketing really that's getting us to buy all these sugars, all these processed sugars and um, trans fats and things of that nature. So there's one company, uh, Ruffles, they're owned by uh, Frito-Lay. They have multiple chips as well. But Ruffles specifically, they're going to be uh, coming out with a um, an all-star campaign where if you buy one of their chips you kind of win a or not really win but you enter into a raffle to win some tickets to the um, 2018 Los Angeles all-star game so you do see that there is still going to be some companies that are going to be capitalizing off of uh, the sugary snacks do you think that there's going to be like a time <coughs> a time duration for like how long those guys still last in the market if more and more people are starting to want to eat healthier um I don't think you can ever say that uh, those kinds of corporations like don't have a place in the market because there's always going to be a demand for it, uh, regardless of the amount of people that eat healthy or eat healthy on a consistent basis. There's always going to be people that enjoy sugary snacks or food that are filled with preservatives. And in all honesty, a lot of people do enjoy them because they taste really good. So um, for a lot of people, I would say there is still a competitive edge and for a lot of companies that thrive on that if it's not broke then why fix it in some cases like and, and that would be their ideas towards it if they find maybe a equally fiscally fiscally responsible way in making the same product where you it's a little bit healthier then i'm sure that it's something that they would consider or not see as a problem but in all honesty if they're producing something and we love it the way it is and they can produce it for a cheap price then what would be the point in them um making their company or their product more socially responsible there isn't really anyone so that's just the cold truth of it in my opinion absolutely i think it's more so on the individual's responsibility to change what they're putting into their bodies as opposed to putting that blame on a company whether it's ruffles chips doritos anyone it's really on us to kind of choose and be more um, careful about what we're consuming i do want to point out um kellogg's they're another big corporation with multiple brands underneath them they did um they did a mandate that they want to kind of contribute to corporate social responsibility and the stakeholders whether it's the fields that they're getting their greens from or just the consumer itself so um, back in 2014, they had a commitment to global sustainability, and they're working towards that. They have some goals already in place, which are on track to um, coming to full fruition by 2020. And we are going to play a clip for that. It's going to be a couple of seconds, but you'll be able to watch it on our Facebook page, where you'll see the short video that they released just, uh, I think it was last week. So take a look at that. We know the world's resources are not unlimited and we need to preserve what is available to us. Which is why through our global sustainability commitments, we're working to minimize our footprint as we grow and make our foods responsibly. Some current events that we can um, take a look at that also goes into what we've been talking about so far within this episode. I do want to bring up some bands because I think that is going to be a very good um, indicator of companies wanting to make a change with their whole um, their whole product line wanting to consumers to eat healthier stuff or even just use products because if you're a vegan it doesn't only um, pertain to just what you're putting in your body in terms of eating it it's also what you're using on your skin there is a ban on microbeads the um, production as well as the importation of the microbeads well, if you're not familiar with that is it's a type of plastic it's a polymer and the reason why it's a negative is because companies are actually producing um, hair products, also, also other household items that have this, um, this chemical in there. And when it goes down your drains, it's going into the, um, the lakes, the bodies of water, which other trophic levels are eating this. And then it does make its way back to the uh, dinner table, really. Do you guys have any um, thoughts or any awareness on this? Actually, I heard a lot on this um, subject in terms of the Michael B. 
beads being in a lot of products that we would use on a normal regular basis i did realize that it was a part of a lot of the cosmetic brands that we uh, are normally sold on uh, media sources and things like that for instance a lot of facial wash and um, like uh, skincare products usually use that as an opportunity to emphasize and um, like a selling quality as in something special that helps them like cleanse their skin and stuff like that with a little knowledge or understanding of how that directly goes back into your body in a negative and toxic way and how something as simple as the little micro beads that are plastic are something that is going into your di your actual digestion system and is negatively impacting you on a daily basis. So. Okay. Another band that we've noticed is the glyphosate band. This is prominent in Sri Lanka. The reason why is because they have a lot of tea production, which is their majority, um, or rather their biggest export. And with the weed control, the glyphosate is what's used to kind of help those tea leaves still come out from the ground. And if there's no um, herbicide that's used, it does ruin the crop they're already suffering from crop loss. If you aren't familiar, Roundup, it's a weed control. I think there's also pest control as well, but the glyphosate is an active ingredient inside that chemical. So it does allow for you to still, in terms of agriculture, grow your crops without the threat of weeds killing, of course, uh, your harvest. So that's something that we've just noticed that is a ban. And it is also implying that there is a lot of Sri Lankan farmers that are losing their, uh, losing their source of income. So do you guys have any um, suggestions on how, I guess within a balance, right, we can also give heed to the environment because there is harm rather being done by using fertilizers, by using herbicides, but there's also definitely a, a business. There's, there's, a, there's commerce, there's trade here occurring. Yeah. It's just, Sri Lanka is so prone to mudslides and landslides that they're losing a lot of land that Sri Lankan farmers don't have a lot of space now to create mass growths of tea crops, right? So they need something to improve growth because without that tea production, Sri Lanka won't be able to produce anything else for their main exporters such as um, Britain and other European countries. So a lot of farmers and a lot of workers won't have any job and they won't have any livelihood anymore because, because of how the tea crops are so inland in Sri Lanka, there's no other job opportunity there. Um, another reason why I feel like it's such a critical topic as well is that we don't want to be consuming pesticides in our drinks either right so it's a hard it's definitely hard to figure out where the balance is do we let farmers not be able to grow their crops and end up dying or do we protect our own health and there needs to be a better situation and i feel like there's organizations out there that can really make a good impact in this situation because it's critical the other competitors we have here like kenya and india if they do take advantage a country like sri lanka won't be able to survive because they don't have any other experts a lot of their a lot of their source of income and um, really the growth in jobs really comes from their imports from uh, China, which um, produces new jobs, produces construction sites, manufacturing uh, factories all across Sri Lanka, and that's what's giving them a new hope. Um, you could look at another industry in uh, Sri Lanka is the fishing, where fishing has took a really big decline. So without any, if they do decide to uh, keep lowering the actual regula regulations for tea production. There's going to be a serious problem in uh, jobs. There's going to be a serious problem in exports, and the overall well-being of Sri Lanka it won't grow. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really familiar with uh, Sri Lanka, but uh, is there an alternative that the government like uh, offered? Uh, since like, because usually with the ban, there's like the, a better alternative to being well, pushed, right, or subsidized. Sri Lanka, because of the civil war, they're in a kind of a sticky situation with the UN with. Uh, war crimes and all that so Sri Lanka is really being critical of what their uh, view is on like the United States Canada and the EU so they're tr really trying to get um, make them happy right they want because they also need foreign aid if you're trying to rebuild the country you're gonna need as much foreign aid as you can because that country is really devastated so they need to be critical they don't want to hurt sentiments on that side where okay now I don't have money to improve my country so they need to when it comes to that tea production, they need to be uh, focused on, okay, their consumers are, they seem like their consumers are much more important than their farmers. And that's the situation you have in Sri Lanka. It's a catch-22 because the consumer, of course, is where the money's coming from. But in order to monetize, of course, those crops, you definitely need some feet on the ground. Yeah. So that's a bit of a, a sticky situation. Who do you, who do you appease yeah. in that circumstance? Okay.
Well, that's a good um, that's a good topic that we touched on. So another thing we can also see in Sri Lanka is that um, there really isn't a lot of space where you can grow tea, especially in the northern part of Sri Lanka where my parents are from. It just doesn't grow there. There's no way to really grow it in that area. So it's really centered into the middle of Sri Lanka, and that's not a lot of space because Sri Lanka is a tiny island. So that that's also an issue. Where do you grow this tea, right? When you're losing um, ground to monsoons on sites, it's so critical where you grow it and who's growing it for you, right? So that's I mean, there's a lot of issues in Sri Lanka that need to be figured out, and the quite I don't feel like that there's nothing to fix it just yet. It's going to take a while. Okay. Yeah. As Buso students, does this um kind of tie into what you guys are learning in lecture or tutorial at all? Oh yes. Uh, so in my policy um, environmental class, like talk about like policy making and uh, management like the you know conservation of nature and one of the things that talked about we were talking about as a as a response to the climate change issue was using some of the practices of ecology like uh, essentially just like quantifying nature on a larger scale so in order to predict like climate change and like how it affects like the environment and the economy right like through soil erosion which goes back to how it affects agriculture on on a trading scale, right? Because that's the whole that's the whole point of comparative advantage to you know trading, and so like that could be seen as a, as an alternative or as an option. But then again, that's when the governments like need to be to play the big role. And uh, since Sri Lanka is having an issue with that, that's when we like, realize that uh, we all need all the pieces to fit at once for like for a major change to happen, right? So, so it's definitely a tough, uh, tough issue. Well, that is going to conclude our second episode of Negative Balance. I do want to thank you guys all for watching. Uh, I do want you guys to uh, all comment, of course, whether it's on our Instagram page or our YouTube channel or on Facebook. Look for us on Instagram. Definitely going to see us all again. And we definitely look forward to seeing you all. So signing out, I'm Jamar. Andre. Christian. Tamara. And that was Negative Balance.